Hello and welcome to Deep Delve, the series taking an in-depth exploration into various musical compositions. This is episode 2 of what I am now calling, per the recommendation of a friend, Vania Mania, where we'll discuss the assorted fan-made arrangements of the Undertale song Megalovania. So last time we talked about the origins and evolution of the Toby Fox versions of Megalovania. This time around, we'll start looking into some of the more popular alternate universe versions. I've decided what I'll be doing, at least for the first few episodes, is picking out three examples to talk about, comparing and contrasting how each version switches up the setting and how the most prominent arrangements of Megalovania affect the feelings supposedly evoked by their respective settings. First, we'll be looking at Outer Tale, because overall it is the same story, just with a space setting instead of underground, and thus we'll mostly just be looking into how that vibe is achieved. Next, we'll look at Underswap, as this is mostly the same story on the surface, but as a consequence of the personality changes, it significantly affects the emotional impact of the piece. Lastly, we'll have a look at Underfell, owing to the radically significant shift in tone and personality of practically everyone in the setting. Something which does bear mentioning with this is that owing to the AU's being community efforts, there is a certain level of difficulty in presenting an accurate framing for the circumstances of their respective Megalovanias. I've tried my best to theorise on what they could be, based on the contexts they're presented in, but the information available is... I'll put it charitably as disorganised and informal. Not much to go over this time, so let's just get straight into it. So like I said, starting with this AU because the story overall pretty much stays the same. The only real difference is that instead of being banished underground, when the war between the humans and monsters happened, the monsters were banished to the moon! By and large, the changes are mostly cosmetic, you know, things like Nabster Blue crying stars, Metaton being star-shaped, that kind of thing. As such, this section is going to be relatively short, and we can just get into the meat of the matter. The Outer Tale version of Megalovania we'll be looking at is by Jeffrey Watkins, which was expressly composed for the Outer Tale fan game. This is by and large the most recognised version, and arguably the one most identifiable as the canon piece. In terms of overall sound and style, it's mostly the same song, how it differs is in the instrumentation used, stripping out the guitars and drums in favour of more keyboards and synths. This lends to it a much more space-agey feel. The harmonic progression is slightly faster, the notes significantly closer together, almost imitating the feel of a ship's engines powering up. In fact, everything in this version is very fractionally up-tempo from the original. It's almost imperceptible, but it is there. Observe. During the bridge, the instrumentation becomes much heavier, just like in the original almost mimicking the sounds of harsh guitars, whilst still being identifiably keyboards. It emphasises this feeling of two people battling on a spaceship, consoles exploding, wires trailing everywhere, everything just getting utterly wrecked in the midst of their fight. So yeah, not really much to go over in this as this is more a matter of affecting a vibe as opposed to telling a different story. As such, now that we've eased ourselves into what the AUs can be like, let's go a bit more off the beaten path with... This is a degree of separation from the original for a very key reason. Primary aspects of the various characters have been swapped such as their overall personality, their role, and the part they play in the story. 
Not wholesale, certain character qualities do carry over, such as San's love of puns, but by and large there has been this switch. Consequently, this does have a rather dramatic effect on the story overall, particularly with Sans and Papyrus, with Sans being the eager little go-getter who wants to become part of the Royal Guard, and Papyrus being the slacker, chilled out dude who just wants what's best for his brother. Now comes the snag that I knew was going to be a danger the moment I undertook this project. Underswap as a creative endeavour has been discontinued and the original author has completely distanced themselves from it. The information I have to hand is what I've been able to glean from the Google Doc that user Demi Raymond has created, coupled with information that I found on the wiki. As it stands, I'm going to have to act to a certain degree on instinct, because even the original Tumblr posts that are attached to the Google Doc no longer exist. Even running them through the Wayback Machine was met with impediments, which, well, I ran this by a colleague of mine, and this was their reaction. So you're telling me that this website, designed specifically for searching through the internet archive for long lost information, is rendered incapable of accessing the information provided by this author's Tumblr? Yep. It's pretty annoying. Gatsooks! Astounding! With all of this in mind, I'm going to be splitting this into two sections discussing the more popular versions of both what's been used for the Sans Encounter and Papyrus's Encounter. I will outline these are by no means the canon versions, but with a project like this, canonicity is going to be extremely nebulous. So, without further ado, let's get to the Sans version. For this section, we'll be looking at Maromania, the version composed by Lucas Pucus, which rearranges and combines two other pieces with the core of Megalovania. I'm doing this for several reasons. First is that the version the author views as the canon piece is ultimately a rework of another piece we'll be discussing in this. It's also the version which gave me the most to work with. And lastly, the original author's attitude to one of the more popular versions, Passive Megalovania, seems to be somewhat... reactionary. By and large, the setup here is mostly the same, the skeleton brothers popping up at various points looking for a human, one of them eager to catch one to prove themselves, the other a supportive goofball. The role's just being reversed, so it's Sans who wants to catch them instead of Papyrus. In both versions, one of the brothers will employ various tricks and traps to try and capture the player character, whilst the other will quip on their almost wily coyote-esque antics. There are only really superficial differences, i.e. instead of physical puzzles, San sets down feeble riddles as impediments to your progress, which when you think about it, makes sense. Sans loves puns and wordplay, so naturally, this would feed into how he might try tackling his target. But soon enough, their childish denial and fixation on duty forces them to challenge the hero to a fight. Just as in the real canon, our hero faces a foe that, despite the challenge they present, is clearly innocent at heart and a friend waiting to be made. So the Sans version, rather intriguingly, has taken elements of both Megalovania and Bone Trussle, Papyrus' battle theme, as a means of driving home the idea of the simultaneous switch and fusion of personalities, along with the fact that it's used in place of where you would originally fight Papyrus. Bone Trussle is a far more light-hearted, almost comical piece, drawing on the same sort of vibes as the likes of spooky, scary skeletons. It's almost like a five-year-old's attempt at being menacing. 
It's jaunty, it's upbeat, and it's trying so hard to be threatening. But as it is, it just can't be, just like the character of Papyrus. As such, its incorporation into Megalovania makes it very effective. A piece about furious desperation to protect everyone turns into almost a mocking finger at San's expense. He's so desperate to prove his worth, and in this desperation attacks the human, which comes through in the Megalovania elements. But the light-hearted true self of Sans, combined with the fact that he could never be a royal guard, is brought out through the melodies of Bone Trussell. There are two very intriguing aspects of this version that really help to drive home the overall intent of the piece. Firstly, is the fact that it's in the key of C minor, the same as Bone Trussell, further shifting the style to more mocking, at occasions even sounding like circus music. Secondly, the dreamlike lay motif present in the original is almost completely absent, as though to lend to the piece the idea that to a certain extent, Sands realises his dreams of joining the Royal Guard are never going to come true. For as silly as this piece comes across, the more you think of it, the more it becomes a bit of a downer. Well, with that morose feeling out of the way, let's have a look at the Papyrus version! So for this part, I'll be discussing the reanimation composition by Keno9988IV, as this is the version which both has its own distinct identity and yet can be recognised as being part of the same family as the actual Megalovanias. Just like in the case of Marimania, contextually the use of this piece is pretty much identical to that of the original, just switching out Sans for Papyrus. However, because Papyrus, unbeknownst to even himself in the main universe, is a bit of a powerhouse, how the situation can be read within the context of Underswap significantly shifts. Instead of a valiant hero making his last stand against an implacable foe, we have a furious god bending off the interloper into his world. The feel of the inverted dreamlike motif present in the original has been utilised, but then turned on its head again by affecting a slightly jarring chord progression, much like in the way the Lavender Town theme from Pokemon messes with your perceptions and expectations, further emphasising the diametric opposition between the character Papyrus presented thus far and the sheer magnitude of his nightmarish power. Once again, Bone Trussell's overall style has been called upon and blended with lay motifs of Megalovania, whilst still being recognisably its own piece. It has a darker, more brooding manner about it, inverting chord progressions to remove the more comedic elements. The instrumentation is that touch heavier than in Megalovania, whilst having the same form of layering as the original, opening with the keyboards and progressing to the guitars and drums, alternating them in and out between verses and pre-chorus, and finishing with just the keyboards. This has an ever so slight key shift which also helps to feed into the overall vibe that the piece has going. Because it's been shifted a semitone down, it emphasises the idea of Papyrus being this impossibly powerful foe, which in turn acts as somewhat of a callback to the first half of Megalovania's use in Homestuck. When I listen to this version, I definitely get the image of a supremely angered individual throwing everything they have at their enemy out of pure hatred for the death of a brother who just wanted to do right. So like I said at the start, there are a lot of versions of the Papyrus Megalovania. The one I've discussed here is just the version that gave me the most to work with. With that said, I am genuinely curious about exploring it more. And if enough of you are interested in me doing so, 
if you sign up to my Patreon, then I will do some special episodes talking about those versions. Now with that out of the way, let's get to the big one of these three, where we significantly shift both tonal and story gears from the original. So rounding out this venture, we get underway with Underfell, as this is the most recognisably different from the original Undertale. For this segment, we'll be looking at another of Keno 9988VI's compositions with capital M, capital E, capital G, capital A, capital L, capital O, capital V, capital A, capital N, capital I, capital A. On the surface, Underfell could be seen as just your typical Mirror Universe take on Undertale. Personalities have been inverted, people are generally much darker, that kind of thing. But once you start digging, you realise it's a bit more complicated than that. Flowey, by and large the original game's main antagonist, has become the main character's companion affecting a personality much more like that of Asriel himself, the child who got reincarnated as Flowey. Temi, the cute little lemonade stand girl, has been turned into an evil Jeff Bezos-esque corporate overlord that all businesses live in constant fear of. Papyrus, Previously an eager, hard-working soul who aspires to become part of the Royal Guard has become a much harsher but simultaneously well-meaning type who, if you read some of the fan content, has been painted as the type who is ultimately doing everything to protect his brother from further harm. And Sans, the charming, prank-pulling, pun-loving goofball has become this abrasive, pun-hating individual who is both emotionally damaged and suffers from an inferiority complex. Which is why the modifications on instrumentation work so well for him. Whilst the original was Sans fighting for his people and home in a desperate bid to save it, this version is from the perspective of a Sans who has been forced to attack someone who is just trying to make friends with everyone. Staccato violins and a tolling bell have been added. The keyboards have an almost organ-like sound to them, and the overall guitar work is much heavier. There's also been another shift in the scale. Still in the minor key, but this time in G sharp instead of D. This gives it a more aggressive, nasty edge. This is not someone fighting valiantly for their people. This is someone who hates himself hates his people and is using this opportunity to take it out on you. At certain points it takes on almost the menace of a slasher movie theme, particularly during the bridge at the 1 minute 6 point, where the instruments become louder, more chaotic and almost combative in vying for being heard over the other instruments. which in itself can be read as Frisk trying to be heard over the chaotic violence that surrounds them in Underfell. Given that this version would be encountered in the pacifist run, it's interesting to consider that instead of San's energy, you'd be wearing down his aggression and resolve until it's broken, effectively echoed in the repetitive nature of the windout. So we can already see how the interactions between concept of AU and highly skilled composers can result in incredibly intriguing perspectives, whether it be to make something dramatically more Lunarian, to shift and modify to affect a reversal in outlooks, or to twist and change to evoke the violence of a darker environment. 
Next time, we'll start digging into some of the more out there AUs and really explore how radically the piece and setting can be modified to the point where it becomes an entirely different story.